you know, I have real respect for all those speakers here. I mean, I work here every day in front of a whole classroom full, but just because there is a camera in front of me, I have so much more stress. I mean, it sounds easy, but... Uh, Matt, Matt, we're live. Eh? What? And uh, the next speaker is... Who is the next speaker? Let's see, let's see. Hi, I'm Mickey. I live here in Benyamina, Israel, somewhere between uh, Haifa and Tel Aviv. Let me show you around. To the north, you can see the slopes of uh, what is known as Mount Carmel. They go all the way up to Haifa. Somewhere in the middle between the hills and here, there is a small creek called Alligator Creek. Uh, no, we don't have alligators here. On the east, uh, Benyamina goes uh, a little bit further and then we head out to a beautiful valley with a lot of vineyards and other places. I live on the north part of Benyamina, so most of the south is just Benyamina houses. And to the west you can see my street and if you go about 20 minutes more to the west you will reach the Mediterranean shore around uh, Caesarea. And that's it, that's where I live. I love this place. And these are Oscar and Mini. They are brother and sister. And they tend to meow mostly when I'm really concentrated on teaching or coding. And here is my office. We came down from the roof inside. I usually sit here in the living room with the laptop on my knees. And heck, that's it. Our next speaker wants you to know that there is a book actually called The Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean, but claims to have never read it. But instead, we're going to learn a lot about how to use JSON in Go properly. So let's go live to Israel. Hello FOSDEM and welcome to my talk. My name is Miki Tabeka and today we are going to talk about JSON serialization. I am assuming that many of you already did JSON serialization and I hope you learned some new things in this talk. So let's start. Before we can talk about JSON serialization, let's talk about serialization in general. Serialization is the act of taking data structure in Go and converting them to a sequence of bytes and back. In Go, we call this marshalling if you work with byte slices. So we do marshal and unmarshal. And if you work with IO reader and writer, we use encoder and decoder. Serialization is usually done at the edges of your program. And one of the code smells of serialization, if you see serialization done again and again in your code. Serialization is everywhere. Computers understand only bytes, and this is the reason we need to use serialization. And even strings, for example, this string serialization, inside the memory is encoded in UTF-8 in the encoding that you see below. So JSON. JSON is one of many, many serialization formats. Right? We have CSVs and XMLs and JSON and message back and flat buffers and protocol buffers and Captain Proto and many, many, many more formats. JSON is super popular because it's natively understood by the browser and it's also textual so humans can understand it. In JSON we have very limited set of types. So we have a number, a single type of number, which in Go we have a lot of numbers. So a number in JSON can go to one of the integers. We have int 8, 16, 32, 64, the unsigned one, float 32, 64, big dot int and big dot float. By default, if you don't give the JSON encoder a hint, it is going to use a float64. Strings in JSON go to strings in Go, and JSON is encoded in UTF-8, so this works nicely for Go as well. Arrays goes to slices in Go, and here you have an issue, because an array in JSON can contain mixed types, and slices in Go have a single type. So if you have a mixed type in a JSON array, we will need to use a slice of the empty interfaces. Booleans go to Booleans, null in JSON go to the nil value, 
and objects in JSON goes to either structs mapping fields from the JSON objects to the struct fields or if you don't use a struct we can use a map from string which are the keys in the JSON object to the empty interface because each field can contain a different type of value. One of the problems with JSON is performance. For example, if we, when I'm talking about performance, we talk about both encoding and decoding speed, or marshalling and unmarshalling, and also the number of bytes it generates. So if we take an int 8, which is a single byte, and we convert it to JSON, when we're going to run this code, you're going to see that the size in Go is a single byte, unsurprisingly, but the size in JSON is 1, 2, 3. If these are three characters, three bytes three times the amount that we're using to store it in Go. So JSON is wasteful in memory. Other binary formats can do much, much better. So we talked about numbers. Here's a message, which is an interface equal to one. So by default, Go is going to make it an integer. We're going to marshal it and then unmarshal it to the reply and print out the message, the reply, and if they're equal. And we are going to run it we're going to see that we get one and one, but they are not equal. And to see the reason, I'm going to print out the types. So we use the capital T verb in printf, which prints the type and the reply. And don't forget the new line and the message and the reply. When I run it again, we see that we sent an integer, but because we used an empty interface to unmarshal, Go went down and created a float64 for us. Let's say we have a struct of payment with time from and to which are strings and the amount is float. And there is no time type in the JSON format. So we create a payment from time.now, Wiley Coyote. You're probably familiar with Wally Coyote. This is this guy who always runs after the Roadrunner. He usually buys stuff from Acme, and this time he bought $123 worth of, plate of things to try and kill the Roadrunner. And now when we do Marshall Indent and print out what we get, we're going to see there was no error, and the time was converted to a string in JSON in some kind of a format. So this is nice, but someone on the other side, when they read this message, need to know the time is actually a timestamp and convert it either in Go or in another language to the equivalent of Go time dot time. How does time do it? There is an interface called json.marshaller, and if you implement this method, marshal json, that returns a byte slice and a possible error, the json encoder is going to use this method instead of doing what they do. And if you look at the sources of go in the time package, you will see that time implements Marshall JSON. It's marshalling it to an RFC 3339 format, which is a known format for time. A good choice. This is also because this time has the year first, then the month, then uh, the day, etc., etc. When you sort it even as a string, this time uh, are also sorted correctly. What happens if you have message with custom time formats? For example, we want to send them as second since epoch. In this case, we can use another time time. This time is p time, which embeds time. By embedding the time, we get all the methods from time, format, add, etc., etc. And now we need to implement Marshall JSON. And to do that, we have three steps. The first step: convert to a value that encoding the JSON can handle. The second step is to use json.marshal on this type. In the third step, there is no third step. On the other side, when we want to get the data back, we do unmarshal JSON. In this case, I'm creating an int64 using fscanf to read the data and then update the struct that we got. And now in my struct, I can use the speed time instead of time. And now when I'm sending data with time as a number, this is going to work out for me. I'm seeing this time. However, there are limitations. If I'm creating a time and then doing an add, 
and then encoding after I added a single second, I've lost the encoding. Right? And the reason is that all of these methods are going to return time. Right? So if I'm going to do printf again of capital T backslash N of T2, and I'm going to run the code again, you see I'm getting back time dot time. And this is a bit of a difference between Go's embedding and the usual inheritance that you used to from other object-oriented languages. What about binary data? So let's say I have an image with a data which is a byte slice. And we said that in general, slices in Go go to JSON arrays. So I have an image, I'm going to read it, set the name and the data, and encode it. And if I'm going to run this one, you're going to see that the data is not an array. It's actually a string. What Go is doing, it's assuming that the byte slice is a binary data. And it is using base64, which is a format of encoding data in a string, encoding binary data in a string, so it can pass it in the JSON. And it also works when you do the unmarshalling or decoding on the other side. When we looked at the generated JSON, we see that, where do I have one? Here. We see that the generated fields are starting with capital letters. Go is just passing in the name of the field using reflection as is to the JSON. But most of the time we want something else. So we can use these field tags to specify what are the fields in JSON that matches these fields in the struct. And this time I'm just going to tell Go to make it lowercase. So when I run it, now you see that I'm getting them in lowercase. Another thing is, you can see that the 2 here is the empty string. And the empty string is being passed here. And this is wasteful. I can add omit empty. And then when I'm going to run it, Go is going to omit all the values that are the zero value for the type. Empty strings, zero numbers, nils, etc., etc. Let's say that we want to keep the person who paid to be confidential. Let's say we have API tokens in the user structs and other things. We can use the minus sign. And the minus sign tells Go, don't encode this value at all. And now we see just the time and the amount. Another thing we can do is we can tell Go uh, that I want to pass this value as a string, even though it's a number. And you see now it's 124 without quotes, and now I'm going to run it. It's going to be 123.45 with quotes. Right, so this mini language that we have inside the field tags is quite powerful, and you can do a lot of things with it. Streaming input. Sometimes we're going to get more and more JSON messages in a single stream over a socket or an HTTP request, etc. The JSON format does not support streaming. There are other um, civilization formats that do support stream also object, and JSON does not. But lucky for you, the JSON decoder handles it without a problem. So we have the data with two JSON objects. I'm creating a decoder over this data, and then I'm running a for loop telling the decoder to decode. When there's no more data, it will tell me by returning an end of file. And then I can break the for loop. Otherwise, I can print the data. And when I run it, I see that I actually get two events. So this is on the input side of things. You really don't need to do anything. On the output side, what Go is doing is that the encoder is going to add a new line. So in our case, I have two events. I'm creating an encoder and then encoding each and every one of them. And you see that Go is adding a new line here between these two. And this is known sometimes as a JSON lines format, meaning every line is a single JSON object. So the receiving side knows that it takes one line at a the, at the time and just pass it as JSON. Here's an example in Python, for example. Um, here's an example in Python. So for every line in the standard input, I'm loading this line with load s, which is Python's way of passing a string, and then printing the object. 
You can take it even further if you go with HTTP. HTTP has something known as chunked encoding. Chunked encoding is able to stream data. It's available since uh, HTTP version 1 of 1. One nice example was written by Rob Pike is robpike.io. If you go to this site, you're going to see that you get piles of poop all the time. So how does it do it? I'm going to use the NCAT utility to, so, to show you the raw data that is coming over HTTP. So I'm going to NCAT to robpike.io port 80, saying I want to get the root document with HTTP 1 and 1, and the host is robpike.io, the host header is required. And then an empty line, meaning end of the request. And I'm getting back HTTP OK, and you see transfer encoding is chunk, a list of headers that I uh, remove, and then I'm getting a line with how many bytes are coming in, and then the data. And this uh, pile of poo is encoded as four bytes in UTF-8, which Ropike helped to design, so it works nicely. If you want to do it in Go, you can do it with the flusher, HTTP flusher interface, right? So you need to check if your HTTP writer supports flushing by uh, doing a type assertion to HTTP flusher, and if it works after every encode, you need to call HTTP flush. Once you do that, again, we can do NC localhost 8080, and you, here we see again that we get content encoding chunked. We get the size. This is the size in hexadecimal, so 14 bytes, and we get the data including the new line that the encoder is doing there. Another thing is missing values. And this is something that is really frustrating in JSON and it's really a hard issue. I don't have a really good solution for that, but I'll show you some ways to deal with it. So we have this payment struct, and then we have this data from to an amount. We're missing the type in our data. And we create a payment, we unmarshal, and we print out the payment. And we print out the payment, this is not going to fail. So if there are missing values in the JSON to fill the fields, Go is just going to use the zero value. So the zero value for time is January 1st, year one. And now we have an issue. How do we know when we got a value, which is the zero value, if the user actually sent us the zero value or they didn't send it at all? Sometimes it doesn't matter, but in other cases, it might be of importance. So one way to deal with things is to move to pointers. So I've changed the time in the struct to be a pointer to time the time. And now when I'm running this code, this time now is going to be nil. I know that nobody sent me any time. This is a way to know if the data was sent or not, but it's a very dangerous uh, path to go into because now you can get a lot of uh, panics because you're trying to access something which is nil. So a way to solve this, not sure if I can recommend it. Another way is to use map structure. Map structure is working like the JSON library, but instead of working with JSON documents, it works with a map from string to interface. And when you work with map structure, you first create a map of string to the empty interface and use JSON marshals to do that. Then use the map structure to decode into our payment. And now we can check in the map if we got the key of time or not. And if we didn't get the key, then we can set the time. So map structure, uh, you do two steps instead of one, but now you get a full knowledge about what was sent over the wire and what was not. This is also good if you have endpoints that get various number or various types of JSON objects that are coming in. So you first unmarshal them to map from string to the empty interface, check the type by looking at keys, or maybe you have a type key or something like that. And according to, once you figure out the, which type of uh, message is that, you can uh, decode it into the right structure and move on from there. Another way, that, and this is the one that I usually use, is start with defaults, because 
JSON is not going to override values that were already there in, in the struct, I can say that in a payment, the default is that it's the current time. Right, and now I have this data, I'm going to unmarshal it, and now when I'm going to run it, uh, this is going to be the data with the current time. And this is probably my favorite one. Another thing you need to remember is that valid JSON does not mean that the data is valid. Let's say I have a location with latitude and longitude, and then I get some data and I'm going to unmarshal it to JSON. And this is going to work. The problem is that this is not a valid latitude. Latitudes can be between minus 90 and 90, and this is not in this area, so this is not good. So you need to do some validation. A common approach is that I'm adding a validate to the objects that I'm using, right? So I have a validate method on the location, it checks for a valid latitude and longitude, otherwise it's going to run. And now, after I'm unmarshalling, I'm always validating the data before I start using it, right? And now I'm going to get an invalid data. And I'm doing it a lot in my HTTP handler. You can write the validation your own. You can use frameworks. There are frameworks such as Q or QLang, uh, which can help you with writing these validations. Uh, I found out that validating data is uh, tricky, and most of these frameworks will get me so far, but at the end, I do write my own code. Strings. So if I have a string, and I'm just going to encode it, what do you think is going to be the output? Take a minute to think, maybe less than a minute, and let's run. And we see that Go is escaping the angular brackets. And this is because Go knows that most of the time when we send data, when we send JSON, we send it to a browser. And it wants to avoid what is known as XSS, uh, so, it is going to escape for us all the data that is coming there. If you don't want that, you can do enc.setEscapeHTML to false. And then, if you're going to rerun it, now you're going to see the string as is. So, go defaults to security, but doesn't have to. Another thing that sometimes when we try to uh, mimic the JSON type, the JSON structure in types, it is going to create a lot, a lot of types, and I call this type pollution. We need to do a lot of types to do that. For example, if you go to stock tweets where stockbrokers lie about what they're trading with, uh, you are going to get a big JSON with a lot of data. This is for the Apple stock, right? So. We get the response, the symbol, the message, and then for every message in this messages array, we're going to have symbols, and for every symbol in the symbol array, we have the symbol name. Let's say I want to count how many symbols are mentioned next to the Apple stock. So I can start doing a response object, and then it should have a response with a status and a symbol, maybe a cursor, and then the messages, but it is going to to take a lot of coding, and this is really not required. What I need to do is model just what I need. And if I'm doing it just inside the function, I also don't need to create a type. I can use anonymous structures. Okay, so here's my pass talks. It gets an IO reader, which can be the request body or when I'm testing the file that I opened, and the symbol. And I'm defining an anonymous structure, which is the reply, and it has a single field called messages, which is a slice of yet more anonymous structures. And these symbols is also a slice of anonymous structures which have a name. And I'm using the field tag to say that this name is actually the, the key symbol in the JSON. And now I'm going to encode, and this is going to get only the values that I want. Once I have this, I can do my map of counting how many stocks are mentioned, 
doing an iterator over the messages of the symbol, ignore the Apple ones that are mentioned next to Apple, and then do the count. And when I run this, I'm seeing that Facebook is mentioned one, Netflix again one, I have um, the SPY mentioned three times. This is valid only, this is valid solution only if you don't share this struct outside. If you want to return the struct outside, of course, I need to create a type to do that. But a lot of time inside the handlers, I don't need to do that. Uh, I can just use a normal structure, but then again, also documentation, if you auto-generate documentation about what's coming in and what's coming out of your handlers, this might be tricky as well. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, my name is Niki Tebeka, as I said. Uh, this is where you can find me, and all of these slides and all of the code and the examples can be seen on my GitHub Talks repo and now it's time for QA. Thank you very much.